Hello and good evening. My name is Brandy Smith. I am the Communications Director for Utah Clean Energy, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our Evening of Hope, a fundraiser to ignite resilience and resolve to meet the climate challenge. The team at Utah Clean Energy is hoping to raise $75,000 this evening to support our climate work. And thanks to our event sponsors, early donors, and everybody who's bought tickets tonight. I'm proud to say we're already over halfway there. I'm gonna serve as your MC for the night, and I'm joined by a few of my colleagues at Utah Clean Energy. We're all scattered about social distancing at the studios of Twig Media Lab. In a few seconds, you'll hear from our executive director, Sarah Wright, who's just getting ready. She's gonna be talking to you about Utah Clean Energy's vision and goals. You're also going to get to meet the newest member of the Utah Clean Energy team, Anna Zanetti, who's getting ready to go on. And then last but not least, our staff attorney, Hunter Holman, is queued up in another building for his Q&A with the star and filmmaker of 2040, Damon Gamow. You'll hear from some of our friends and supporters about what brings them hope in the face of climate change. Throughout the evening, we hope you'll check out the chat feature to the right <laughs> of the screen. Say hi to us, let us know your thoughts, and chat with the friends who you joined with this evening. We also hope that you'll choose to donate and support Utah Clean Energy's work tonight. And to do that, just look for the donate buttons at the bottom of the screen. You won't be forced to navigate away in any way. Now, before we dig into the next hour, I really need to take a minute to recognize the partners that brought us to this point tonight. Each one of tonight's event sponsors has shown up for Utah Clean Energy time and time again. They are true friends and allies, all of which we've been proud to know and work with for many years now. The thing is, is they knew by sponsoring tonight that they weren't gonna get to network with the fancy pants legislators or invite clients to get their picture taken with our keynote speaker. But they said yes anyway, because our climate can't wait. So I wanna send a very sincere thank you first to our co-hosts of the night, Zions Bank, one of the most committed and impactful community partners, not just for clean air and climate, but across a breadth of community issues. And then Facebook, who just announced their commitment to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2030, investing in 600 megawatts of new renewable energy in Utah. And then Gardner Company, who is advancing high performance construction and on-site utility-scale renewable energy development across the country. We simply could not be more proud to partner with them. Then there's our terawatt sponsor, Hunt Electric's Renewable Energy Division. This is a company that continues to lead in Utah's renewable energy growth. And to our wonderful gigawatt sponsors and friends, I want to say thank you to Cirque Energy, ETC Group, GSBS Architects, KW Engineering, Century Financial, The Nature Conservancy, and Wilden. And last but certainly not least, a big thank you to the fantastic teams here at Twig Media Lab and Mindduct that have helped us create tonight's virtual event. I also want to recognize all of the virtual table hosts who so generously bought tables and invited many of you to join us tonight. Thank you for supporting us. It can't be said enough. Thank you to our event sponsors for your ongoing leadership, partnership, and your friendship. Now, I am gonna turn things over to our team's leader, the founder and executive director of Utah Clean Energy, Sarah Wright. Thank you, Brandy. I echo your heartfelt thanks to all of our sponsors, our table host, and all of you who took the time to join us tonight. I hope you enjoy the evening, but more importantly, I hope we all leave here more inspired and with renewed hope and resolve that together we can turn the tide on climate change. This past year has turned our world upside down in the blink of an eye. We can't underestimate the ripple effect that the COVID-19 pandemic will continue to have on our lives, on our health, and on our economy. 
And we can't ignore the racial injustices and inequity that plagues our world. And here's the kicker. This is what you, me, and all of us are trying to come to grips with. This is on top of the wildfires, the extreme storms, and the droughts that are all brought on by climate change. But amid all of this, the past year has also brought to light new hope. We've seen the extraordinary things that we can do to care for each other and to build our community. We know how resilient we are and how quickly we can respond and adapt. And we know how much we need each other. Utah Clean Energy staff of 13 may be small, but the things that we get done never cease to amaze me. And your support is what enables Utah Clean Energy's success. I know I speak for all of us when I say we remain steadfast in our mission to turn the tide on climate change and to pave the way for a healthy planet for this and the next generation. Thank you again for joining us for this special evening. State recorded more than 1,400 new COVID-19 cases on Friday. I've taken care of a lot of people with COVID that have lived that are going to be debilitated for the rest of their life. Sustained winds were recorded at 150 miles an hour. If the wind didn't destroy it, it is now covered in water. Number and size of all of these wildfires is a testament to how dry and dangerous it is right now. We have a 50% increase in the number of fires. Again, I'm so thrilled that you are here with us tonight, and I so wish we could all be here together in person. I have had the pleasure of working with many of you over the years, and I'm really excited that some of you are joining us for the first time tonight. People know us for different facets of our work. Some of you may know Utah Clean Energy from our community solar and electric vehicle programs, or our light bulb exchanges, or maybe you follow our work to reshape the utility and advance energy policies. But our vision for a healthy climate goes beyond any single program. There are many ways that we can all work to address climate change. And as for Utah Clean Energy's role, we aim to transform the entire energy system. And we do this in partnership with you, our partners across the state and across the country. This may seem daunting, but it's actually quite simple. We need to accomplish four things. First, we need to transform our utility system so that clean, renewable energy powers our lives. 
Second, we need to make our homes, our buildings, and our businesses net zero and carbon free. And third, we need to electrify our entire transportation system with electric vehicles, electric buses, and a robust charging infrastructure. All of these not only benefit our climate, but our local air quality as well. And finally, a key to bringing about such profound change at the scale and pace necessary is to move beyond partisanship and to have Utah rise to the forefront as an unexpected national leader advancing climate solutions. Achieving these goals is our greatest challenge, but it's also our greatest opportunity. We have the technologies, they're economic, and with a shared vision, renewed hope, and a resolve to succeed, we can do this. That's a lot about Utah Clean Energy's vision and our work, but now I get to pass things off to Brandy, and she's going to share some stories of people like you who are working on climate solutions. As Sarah said, all we have to do is look around to see the possibility at our fingertips. Even with the extraordinary challenges in the past year, Utahns of all stripes, of all backgrounds, have stepped up for a healthy climate. We've captured a few of these stories, and keep in mind that each story represents a groundswell of actions by thousands of Utahns, just like you, who are taking action for a healthy climate. For starters, you likely either know or are already one of the thousands of Utah families that are powering their homes with clean, homegrown solar energy, made possible by the pro-solar policies and incentives that Utah Clean Energy has worked to enable and to protect for over a decade. Here is just one example of how solar can power our lives. We do get a net metering credit for the energy that we produce from our solar panels. Right now, we have essentially a zero energy bill. We pay the connection fee that's required to Rocky Mountain Power. It's about $10 a month. To pay for our solar installation with the upfront cost, we were able to utilize both the state and federal tax incentive, which was really helpful in getting that into the affordable price range for us. In order to lower our family's carbon footprint, we have also invested in an electric car and an electric bike. We invested in the car before the panels. So although the car is a zero tailpipe emissions, we wanted the energy that it's using to also be clean energy. Getting the solar panels really made that feel like a great decision. Making these decisions, investing in these things, the way I feel it contributes to the larger picture of climate change is creating demand for these products. It's showing what the way you want the world to be to other people. We often joke that energy efficiency is the unsung hero of a healthy climate. Seemingly small actions like lighting and heating are at the center of combating climate change, which is why Utah Clean Energy has been front and center fighting for robust energy efficiency programs for Utah. Calvary Baptist Church is leading by example to be stewards of the earth through saving energy in their church. Reverend Dr. Oscar Moses, um, senior pastor of Calvary Baptist Church, and we are in the building on the campus of Calvary Baptist Church. Calvary is the largest African-American church in Utah. We have a diverse congregation made up of all ethnicities. I am blessed to succeed a very strong, prominent leader in the community, and that is Reverend France Davis. I think God has assigned me to Calvary to connect with people that are concerned about the matters of the earth and the urgency of taking action to save our planet. And so I think it's our contribution to society and it reflects our stewardship as Christians. We did take on some energy upgrades and I'm thanking God for those. The upgrades that we have taken on are estimated to cut energy consumption by 158,000 kilowatts. It's equivalent to over 275,000 miles of a car not being driven. If we could just create a movement with this, and of course movements are not, are not forced, they're felt, but if they can feel the, uh, the passion that comes from uh, even this interview and the partnerships that have been established, perhaps it might create some, um, some motivations for others to, uh, to follow suit. 
But we aren't going to meet the climate challenge without revamping the way we build. If we can build our homes ultra energy efficient, particularly for those families struggling to make ends meet, we'll not only be addressing the climate challenge head on, but we'll be making life just a little bit easier for those struggling to pay their energy bills. Fellow nonprofit Habitat for Humanity is already working to make affordable housing available to Utah families. So what a perfect partner to pilot a program to help start saving energy and saving money at home. In the past year, Utah Clean Energy has teamed up with Habitat for Humanity of Summit and Wasatch Counties to help them build homes to the U.S. Department of Energy's Zero Energy Ready Home standard. These homes are so energy efficient that they only need a small amount of renewable energy to meet their energy needs and have extremely low monthly energy bills. What's even cooler is that Habitat is piloting cold climate heat pump technologies that eliminate on-site emissions for space heating. We're going to go with this very robust building envelope. It's heavily insulated, it's very tight. It's gonna allow us to accomplish our space heating needs in the dead of winter with just this air source heat pump. Habitat had to rethink how to get to this zero energy rating standard really from the ground up. And they did this by conducting early stage energy modeling and energy analysis to set a target of energy efficiency. They looked at what did they need to do to modify insulation they looked at making sure that the house was PV ready for solar to be installed in the future. Our goal is that this pilot program will ultimately change the way Habitat for Humanity builds their new homes and teaches more builders and developers a better, more sustainable way to build the homes we all live in. My name is Arcadio Madrigal. I'm the builder for Habitat for Humanity. Uh, I gotta say, I built a lot of houses, but not like this one, net zero. So basically for the homeowner, it's going to be zero energy. They're going to be saving money. Homes like this can really serve as a model for how homes in Utah can be built that are affordable, that are comfortable, and that have a very small, if not a zero, carbon footprint. Last but certainly not least is Utah's climate leadership. Just a few weeks ago, one of our top priorities to make Utah a national leader on climate solutions hit an amazing milestone. We launched the Utah Climate and Clean Air Compact. This is a trailblazing commitment signed by hundreds of Utah leaders from our faith, business, and government institutions. Here's just a few highlights. I focus on just four zeros. How do we produce zero net energy buildings? That's buildings that produce as much energy as they consume. Zero waste manufacturing, stimulating manufacturers to design and build products that use fewer raw materials and materials that are easily dissembled and recycled. Uh, a zero carbon grid, that's a grid that combines renewable portfolio generation at utility scale with consumers also putting up solar panels on their homes and massive use of batteries. And lastly, zero emissions transportation, that's transportation that combines electric vehicles with a decarbonized grid. Those four zeros, if we can get those 20 countries to work on just those four zeros, we can actually change the world. And we can create the most incredible economic opportunities for Utah companies and companies all over America. This is Congressman John Curtis. So pleased to be part of the launch of the Utah Climate and Clean Air Compact. Thank you to so many who have worked hard on this document. I brag about my state all the time in Washington, D.C. And once again, we're proving that we're leaders on this very important issue. Utahns want to take care of this earth. They want to be good stewards. And this gives them the pathway to do that. Thank you to everybody. 
my friends, thanks to collective actions of people like you, we have come a long way together to give our kids a healthy and livable planet. I know that tackling climate change can seem overwhelming and the future right now is uncertain. But I personally am still filled with hope. Why? The people I've met over the past 12 years, they've shown me that we are in this together. And a few of these friends would like to share with you tonight what gives them hope. Good afternoon. My name is Dan Dugan. And I'm Sarah Buck. And we're really excited to be here tonight with the Utah Clean Energy Gala event. What a great organization, and we're all privileged to be part of that great organization. I've brought you to my neighborhood, and we are in the International Peace Gardens. And the whole purpose of the International Peace Gardens is to talk about equity, and to talk about diversity, and to talk about how we should work together as a community. Hi, I'm Alex Honnold. I am a professional rock climber and the founder of the Honnold Foundation. And I'm speaking to you today from South Lake Tahoe, California which actually you should be able to see the lake behind me, but uh, it's also incredibly gray here because the sun is blotted out by all the smoke from the recent forest fires in California. We're here today talking to you on a beautiful October day after a summer of extended dry conditions and record setting temperatures. I stand here in the shadows and in the protection of our ancestral mountains. The mountains called by our ancestors I am a pediatric emergency medicine physician at Primary Children's Hospital and the Director of Global and Rural and Underserved Child Health at the University of Utah School of Medicine. The reason why I'm talking to you today is about climate change and how it disproportionately impacts communities of color. The air we breathe in Salt Lake City is not the same. It, the further west you go, the more industry you find and you see kids who have asthma, you see all kinds of other disparities. And so these are some things that when we're talking about climate change, we also need to acknowledge that there are other barriers for many in our community. Climate change is recognized as the number one public health threat currently facing us. And that's quite significant if you consider what's going on right now in the world. As a global child health expert, and just as a physician and a father, it's imperative that I take action on climate change. In ancient times, we were given the charge of taking care of both our Sky Father and our Earth Mother. On this day, I weep and I mourn for my relatives who live in the far distant islands of the Pacific. Islands that are disappearing because of the ever increasing levels of the sea. Climate change is certainly the most pressing issue of my lifetime, certainly of this generation. Um, though in a way it's also a tremendous opportunity to sort of remake the world in a slightly more equitable way. I mean, that's certainly what we're trying to do at the Honnold Foundation, is to use renewable energy, in our case specifically solar power, to you know, not only reduce human emissions and hopefully prevent the worst of climate change, but also to make sure that, that the right people, uh, you know, people who have been historically disadvantaged are able to have access to energy. So what really makes me hopeful for the future, even with understanding so much of this very dystopian idea with climate change is that we have a large young generation of people who are radically advocating for environmental, social justice on all platforms and connecting these different single issues and realizing that holistically, these are all very much so intertwined. I mean, you know, it's a little bit cliche, but it does seem like, uh, you know, any big challenge is also an opportunity to, to redo things better. And that's kind of what I hope we do through climate change. And even though the scale of the problem seems daunting and almost too big to comprehend, I know that collectively we can face challenges and we can make improvements. The younger generation gives me hope. They don't like what they're seeing and they're demanding clean air, clean water, and a clean environment. And we've taught them they can have anything they want if they put their minds to it. And they're demanding and they want it. And they are gonna be the change we wanna see in the world. What gives me hope is having the opportunity to teach the next generation about energy alternatives. 
what's been really fun too for, for me is uh, getting to shape these two young, beautiful minds, teaching them that energy doesn't just come from fossil fuels. They've both been raised at a young age, seeing solar panels on their toys and on our house. They've seen cars that plug into the wall as opposed to in the gas station. And that's what they know. I think they're truly the first generation that that's the norm. And that's really exciting. Uh, to me and to both of us. Let our stories and beliefs speak for themselves when it comes to climates, when it comes to looking after our planet, when it comes to climate concerns and climate control. Climate change can be mitigated, can be fixed, as well as these other things like sexism, racism, classism. The time, the technology, and the energy is here. I encourage you all to get engaged, get educated, and be part of the change. This year we're going to increase our donation because there's an increased need for the work that they're doing. We can all see it and feel it. So take a moment to consider all the ways clean energy affects your life and dig deep tonight. Dig deep so that you don't have to wonder if you could have done more. We can't wait, we can't fail, we must act now. My name is Anna Zanetti and I'm the new development director with Utah Clean Energy. I've only been with the organization for a month and I can tell you that I am truly inspired by this team, their passion and their ability to get things done. But I'm sure you'll agree, we have a lot of work ahead of us. We know the clock is ticking. We have until 2030 to cut carbon emissions on a global scale. So here's the thing. I know we've all experienced many hardships lately. From the onset of COVID-19 and all of those who've been impacted and loved ones lost, the earthquake that shook many homes and lives this past spring, and the recent windstorm that left thousands of people without power. It's been a difficult year for everyone. And yet you were here tonight. You showed up to find out how you can make a difference for our climate. We don't make this ask lightly, but please dig deep to help us overcome these challenges that face us today so we can transition to a clean energy economy to ensure healthy, thriving communities for everyone from Salt Lake to Park City to St. George and eventually worldwide. All should be powered and sustained by clean energy. You can give this evening right now by donating online below this screen. A few of you this evening may have the ability to make a major gift right now of $5,000. If so, it would have a huge impact on our organization and supply the funds that we need because our climate can't wait. If you can give 2,500, 1,000, please do so. Whatever level you are comfortable with, 500, 200, 100, or 50. Collectively, every gift helps. Or maybe it's easier for you to make a monthly donation to help sustain us. Now is the time that you can make a difference. Thank you all for your support. It means so much to us. And now the highlight of the night is an interview with actor and filmmaker Damon Gamo and Utah Clean Energy staff attorney Hunter Holman. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight for our Evening of Hope. Uh, my name is Hunter Holman. I'm the staff attorney with Utah Clean Energy. Uh, and I have the privilege and pleasure of introducing uh, Damon Gamow. He's the uh, star and director of a documentary, 2040. Uh, we're going to be doing a Q&A tonight. And before we get started, uh, I think we're going to play a short clip from his film, 2040. My name is Damon, and this is my daughter, Velvet. Her major concern right now is the elusive art of sleep direction. But soon, she'll have to face a rapidly deteriorating environment. The ice sheet is now melting faster than the scientists predicted. I think there's room for a different story, a story that focuses on the solutions to some of these problems. So in 2040, what will the world look like for our daughter if we just embrace the best that already exists? Instead of having governments that are reacting to disaster, we need governments and businesses that actually take us off in a different direction. Maybe it's farming, or it can be energy, or it can be housing, or it can be empowering girls. 
I'd like to see deforestation being stopped. Oh, that would be so cool. That'd be awesome. Just be respectful to Earth. Imagine velvet. We've adopted regenerative practices like phrases. Pulling the carbon into the soil and making it healthier. That's right, yeah. And we embrace efficient local energy. Bangladesh has 5 million solar home systems. They have their power in their own hands. This is bringing people together. But here I am sitting on an aeroplane that is spewing out carbon. You can't help but be a hypocrite because our entire system is built on fossil fuels. What were you guys thinking? Well, sometimes we weren't. power of innovation, imagination, creativity, this is within all people. People want to be working on something that they can see is actually helping to regenerate the world. Everywhere you look, you will see incredible reasons for hope. You could feed 10 billion people with the protein from marine permaculture alone. Wow. Not only are there so many people who want to take part in telling a new story? We have everything we need right now to make it happen. What's your 2040? I just want the future to be good. So before I introduce Damon, I just want to say how excited I am to have this opportunity to speak with him uh, about this film and about these issues. Um, I often find myself so deep in the weeds in regulatory proceedings and matters uh, that Utah Clean Energy is working on. Uh, it's, it's some, it's, it, watching this film was such a wonderful opportunity to kind of step back and see the forest through the trees again and, and be reminded of all the wonderful opportunities that we have as a society uh, at our fingertips today to solve some of these pressing issues. So I'm very excited to have this opportunity. Damon, thanks so much for joining us and welcome. Yeah, lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Well, why don't we uh, dive right into it? So um, the first couple questions I have uh, are, are focused on, on the reasons why you decided to make this film 2040. Um, and, and the, the method that you use to communicate the messages. So the first question I have is kind of directed at um, your comment that you felt like an overwhelmed parent when you would read articles about climate change and predictions of the future. It's very doom and gloom, very negative. Um, and I think a lot of us uh, can, can really relate to that feeling of being overwhelmed. So could you just mm. talk a little bit about um, you know, why you decided to make this film? Yeah, I mean, the catalyst was uh, about five years ago, I was reading in our newspaper here in Australia about uh, a recent bleaching event on the Great Barrier Reef. And uh, about halfway through the article, I found myself turning the page of the paper and, and starting a new article. And I stopped a few sentences in and thought, hang on, I I'm a father of a two-year-old daughter. I care about these ecological issues. What was it about that story that I didn't connect with? Why did I not want to, 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 to understand it at a deeper level? And yeah. so I just started doing a little bit of research and spoke to a couple of psychologists just around the way humans respond to this kind of information and came across um, uh, an environmental psychologist actually in the US named Dr. Renee Lertzman. And she really explained the neuroscience or the recent neuroscience around when we only hear information that comes with fear or dread or overwhelm it can activate a part of our brain, the limbic system. And when that limbic system's activated, it shuts down all the parts of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, where we problem solve and we think creatively. So if we are only using that one narrative to try and get people to, to, to take action, um, I think we're actually causing paralysis in a huge amount of people. So I just thought there was an opportunity to not shy away from the urgency, but actually talk about this problem through a solutions lens instead of just this fear-based uh, apocalyptic lens and the more I researched I spent the next year speaking to a hundred different academics and researchers and futurists and economists I just felt my own spirits lift and I couldn't believe how many wonderful solutions were out there that were just not reporting in the mainstream media networks and, and these are the stories that we can use to inspire people and motivate them and, and bring them on uh, to be a part of this incredible journey so uh, I just thought you know there's an opportunity here to reframe this moment not as a a story of depravity and sacrifice and all the things we have to give up but actually tell a story about the opportunities that are available and the better world that we can create on the other side of this crisis by strengthening our communities again 
having healthier food by getting that carbon into the soil, uh, decentralizing our energy system so, so more people can own that, uh, that energy. Yeah. Uh, it just felt like a, an exciting story to tell. Um, but I was always aware that you know, I didn't want this to be just a utopian, uh, fanciful vision shying away from, from what we need to do. Um, and that's why I called the film an exercise, in fact, based dreaming. So I wasn't making anything yeah. up. It was just an extrapolation of everything we already have. So next, I, I want to show another clip really quickly, uh, one of my favorite clips from the film. This is um, a group of children uh, offering their own solutions to some of these issues. <laughs> well, what would make me happy in the world is, hmm. I think we should get this invention, which sucks up all of the rubbish in the world and puts it in an intergalactic dimension. I framtiden skulle jag nog vilja att man typ skulle kunna plantera ett frö och sen växte det upp en köttbit som man slipper döda djur. Nikiwa mkubwa, ningependa kuona mazingira masafi kwa sababu nispate magonjwa. Well, I would like for the government to have done something on global warming and pollution as now I think they're not really doing anything about it. So I, I think this clip is one of my favorite parts of the movie, in part because it just kind of showcases the unbridled enthusiasm and imagination of kids to think something up like uh, an alternate reality that you can gather up all the rubbish in the world <laughs> and put it into this alternate reality or state of being. Um, but the other reason why this, this, these, these sections of the movie were, were so impactful for me were it, it really shows that the children that you interviewed have a pretty firm understanding of some of the, the serious issues that climate change poses for their future and our future. But more importantly, they also understand some of the, the clear solutions that we can deploy today uh, to solve some of those issues. So I wanted to just ask you, were you surprised when you heard these kids talk about you know, climate change issues so, so intelligently? Yeah, I mean, that was really important for me is that the last thing I wanted this film to be was um, a, a vision of the future based on a, a, on a middle class white guy from Australia. I, I really wanted to make sure that I consulted that generation that were going to be really in their prime in 2040 uh, to see what kind of world they wanted. And then I really shaped the narrative after listening to those kids. And we interviewed 130 kids from you know, Tanzania wow. to Bangladesh to Stockholm to the Bronx to, to, you know, to Melbourne in Australia. And it was a really profound experience for me. I, I didn't think the children would be that articulate. I mean, these were kids from six to, to 11. And they yeah. were just so well versed on what's going on. And they're obviously learning these things at school. But equally, it was really tough to hear some of the emotions they are grappling with. And, you know, they're being taught in class that we're going to have more plastic in the ocean than fish by 2050. And this weighs very heavily on them. So it, it was even more of an impetus to get this film out there and, and say, you know what? Let's stop bombarding our kids only with these doomsday messages. They have to know that there are millions of people that care about their future. And there are solutions that exist that could give them a profoundly better future than we even have now. And let's try and inspire them. Show them what their careers of the future might be. Because we're going to need them to get involved in a very deep yeah. way if we're going to pull this off. And as you've alluded to, they just have a, an innocence and there's a common sense that comes through I think in there in there that we, that we sometimes yeah. lose as adults because we cloud ourselves with all the you know the inertia of the system but they really see this as in a very clear way and it's just like let's get on with this uh, and I just thought it was very important to include their voices and uh, it's been wonderful I've, I stay in touch with a lot of them and um, they've been very nice. moved by the film and the impact it's had around the world and and a lot of them are, are, are now passionate about this area and are sending us their own inventions or things they've done at school and what changes they've made at their school so you know i just think this is strong evidence that we've got to really be strategic with our storytelling and and, and make sure we're inspiring inspiring these children yeah one of the things that um i think i might have heard you say this in another interview um but it, it relates to this and i want to bring it up this this idea that you know these solutions that you present in your in your film are solutions that we have today we, we we know about them and we can deploy them but not a whole lot of people know about them and i think there's a there's a something of a barrier to fully implementing these solutions in that people don't know about it so 
I guess the question that I have for you is, um, you know, when you were looking for these solutions and when you found them, were they hiding under rocks? Were they difficult to find? Or, or you, know, you know, why don't we all sort of know about these solutions today? Yeah, that's a really important question. And I think um, you and I are obviously in this space and, and so it's, it's part of our life and we're looking for these things. But, you know, when you think that even in Australia, and I'm sure it's the same in your country, even our mainstream news service is not acknowledging climate change in the way it should. You know, our weather reporters yeah. don't even factor the, the climate impacts of, of, of climate change. So when we're not even talking about the scale of the problem, um, then it's less likely that we're going to be talking about the solutions that are available. Yeah. So that was, again, a huge motivation was to say, and again, in releasing the film around the world, it's been terrific to have access to certain organisations like you know, the BBC or ITV or our channels here and sit down with some of their editors after the interview and say, and they would say to me, look, we, we often cover climate change, but yes, it's, it's about a horrific flood or it's about yeah. some kind of horrible um, you know, forest fire. What we haven't been doing is focusing on some of the solutions and profiling the people. So, you know, I really hope that the film is a bit of an impetus for that, uh, for some of these media outlets, because as we've alluded to, you know, storytelling, I think, is the most important thing here. We, we are all living in a collective story. We're seeing a story unravel, especially in your country right now. So we have an opportunity of, of starting to tell a new story. And who are the lead characters in that story? Who's being looked after? What are the metaphors? What are the new myths? about how we interact with our planet. That's what's up for grabs right now. And I think it's incumbent on all media outlets or anyone that has a voice or a platform or is a storyteller or a songwriter or a musician uh, to be talking about this stuff and disseminating the science and infusing culture with it so that we can create change. That's how it's happened. It's not going to happen through words like you know, anthropogenic and negative emissions and 1.5 degrees warming. The public just yeah. don't connect with that. They don't really understand what that means. We need artists to get involved and to, uh, and to really you know, inspire and move people with this information. Yeah, I really like the idea of, of involving artists to, to, to be able to speak to, to humans on a more human level as opposed to a more analytical <laughs> level. Um, mm. It seems like an, an obvious turn of events, but here we are. Um, so the, the next thing I want to shift to is, is to talk a little bit about the decentralized grid, the energy component of your film. Uh, another one of the stories that you presented there that, that the folks at Utah Clean Energy were fascinated with was uh, the story of Neil Tahane um, from, from Bangladesh. So I, I think we're going to play a quick clip uh, and we'll be back. There is still a segment of the population that still can't afford to buy a solar home system. So instead of doing that, if they can just buy a small soul box, they can just buy energy when they need it. You fill up your soul box with money. As you keep using energy, it deducts money. What this means is that all the boxes can connect to each other to form a microgrid. It's like a water tank of community energy that people can give to or take from. The beauty is that this microgrid can then connect to the adjacent village's microgrid and the network becomes stronger and stronger. There's a mimicking of nature here, isn't there? Like in the way that cells multiply and form something and strengthen. Yeah, yeah it's... That's, that's a great analogy. You have one solar home system, you interconnect with your neighbors, you make it 50. Slowly you interconnect villages. Once you've collected 100 villages, you can hook it up to the grid. You can sell to the grid. Forget buying from it. You become the primary energy generation source for the country. So the idea is we are like a swarm of bees or a swarm of fish that move together, pool in all our energies together to run bigger loads. So encouraging rooftop solar and driving more energy storage is, is one of the key issues that Utah Clean Energy works on in Utah. We, Utah is a fantastic state for solar and we're primed for the pairing of solar and storage uh, in folks' homes. Um, but implementing this kind of technology can be somewhat tricky in countries like the United States and, and I think Australia, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and so we're really looking to the rest of the world to kind of show us how successful and the types of benefits that people can derive from this kind of ground up decentralized grid. Um, so I'm wondering, have you seen uh, opportunities or examples from other countries or communities um, that have been able to move past some of the hurdles 
that exist in the United States and, and, and Australia and, and be able to implement this kind of technology. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I see this solution as such a metaphor for what needs to happen uh, in a whole range of different sectors and even systemically, that we have a system design right now that is very hierarchical and top down and, and really suits those people at the top. And the architecture of that system, you know, is really suited to that setup. Whereas what this model does is really, like you said, take it from the ground up and decentralize the ownership and the sharing models. So the challenge there is that obviously we've built grid structures, especially in your country, in my country, that are suited for those more centralized energy generation, like the big coal power stations. So it does take a huge effort and an engineering feat to uh, alter our grid to be able to allow these types of microgrids in. But Australia is uh, making some incredible headway here, even the last couple of years. So in, in 2010, we only had 100,000 solar systems on our rooftops in Australia. We're now at two and a half million, uh, and we're only a country of 24 million people. So the uptake has been extraordinary. And what that's done is just really pushed all sorts of innovation and creativity. So we're seeing uh, community power batteries now where you know uh, 10 or 12 houses will have their own storage, centralized storage system they can uh, use and access. Uh, the grids is now, are now being designed to utilize those kind of batteries. Uh, we're seeing a virtual power plant in South Australia of 60,000 homes that have rooftop batteries and, and uh, sorry, rooftop solar panels and batteries. And the grid is able to access those batteries in certain times to stabilise the grid and the energy demand, which is just, you know, a wonderful. Uh, and we're yeah. even seeing some of our bushfire connect, connect uh, infected communities that uh, happened obviously early this year. Some of those regional towns are not rejoining the main grid. They're actually choosing to set up their own decentralised networks. So. Um, there's a lot of discussion wow. about that now, this, this idea of energy sovereignty. And thankfully, uh, the regulations are starting to shift. It, it wasn't the case. It was illegal only three years ago. But I think people have just seen the benefits now. And, you know, we're even talk talking about using electric vehicles as well as um, and the batteries in them also to connect them to the grid so that when they're, they're not in use that the grid can access them as well. So this is an extraordinary re revolution that we're living through. And I think Australia is... In many ways, even though we're not getting the leadership we need, we're, we're much like your country. We're, we have a, a, a government that doesn't really understand climate change or think it's happening. But the business sector is just running with this and, and the states are running with this uh, and things are moving incredibly quickly. That's fantastic. Yeah, I, I had no idea that Australia had made so many, uh, so many strides in this area. Is there a particular tipping point or certain event that you can point to that, that kind of galvanized this shift or did it just sort of, sort of happen overnight, not overnight, but just sort of or, organically? Well, I think the advantage we have here is that we just have an extraordinary amount of sun, you know, like more than any yeah. other country. So I think the language is starting to, people are starting to see that that's our great economic advantage. And even though our government is still investing in more gas and we've still been talking about building more coal, the business sector is saying, well, no, you know, Australia can actually lead this sort of lower carbon economy and, and actually get right out in front. And in fact, we've got a group of billionaires here that have just set up a project called the Sun Cable Project, which is a huge uh, solar farm up in our Northern Territory, 23 million panels. And Singapore yeah. have already agreed to, they will run 20% of their, of their energy uh, from that solar. So we're gonna be exporting solar via an undersea cable to Singapore. So if that works, you know, that then That's opens wild. up uh, Indonesia and all these other markets for us uh, in Southeast Asia that obviously are still running on coal, they're developing and they're going to need that solar. So um, I think, you know, the plan for Australia is to not just get to 100% renewables, but to get to 700% renewables so we can yeah. use that excess energy, we can sell it, we can run our manufacturing and we can actually really get out in front and be a bit of a superpower when it comes to renewables. Yeah, it sounds like a perfect example of, of the cascading benefits of, of climate solutions that you alluded to earlier. <laughs> That's, right. That's yeah. right. Absolutely. So uh, you, you just mentioned coal plants. Um, Utah has a fair number of coal plants. Um, and one of the issues that we're facing as a state is how to transition to clean energy without leaving behind the people in the communities that rely on coal mines and coal plants um, and that have been powering our economy and our society for decades. You know, we, we don't want to leave them high and dry, uh, but we do need to transition. Um, so the question I have for you here is, uh, in, in researching this film, did you discover any countries or communities that have successfully navigated this sometimes mm. sticky uh, issue and, and how did they do it? Mm. What did they do? But what would be really great during this transition, Velvet? is if the people who work in the fossil fuel industry are given support 
and funding for retraining in new careers. Paid for by redirecting some of the $10 million a minute governments currently spend subsidising fossil fuels. Yeah, I'm glad you raised this point, Hunter. It's, um, uh, we've got obviously a huge uh, coal mining communities in Australia and we spend a lot of time sitting around kitchen tables having cups of tea and biscuits and talking about this stuff and it's just extraordinary. I mean, so many of these people do understand what's going on, but they have, I mean, up until only recently, this is a job they've been incredibly proud of. They're, they're, you know, for generations their family has worked in these areas and they have powered economies, they have built countries and that was something yeah. they were very proud of. And uh, suddenly they're being told that they're destroying the planet and people are coming in and totally dehumanising the whole process. And it's little wonder that they're pushing back and reacting. So yeah. I think it's so important that we humanise this and actually transition in a very meaningful and careful way. Um, we're dealing with that in Australia ourselves right now. It hasn't been done perfectly just yet. Uh, the best model that I found was probably in Germany. They started doing this in the late 90s. Uh, they set up a program in 1998 that ran to 2003 where they went in and they retrained and they reskilled the workers. They paid them compensation for moving away for their jobs. And the whole thing was handled very, very intelligent and, and with compassion. And yeah. we've just done a, another project I'm working on here in Australia. We've just gone into some of these communities and asked them about uh, this transition. And most of them have said, look, we know this is happening. If you can help us you know, with a new job, we would happily move to hydrogen manufacturing or electric vehicles or battery components. We love the idea yeah. of big industry and, and putting on our high-vis vests and, and getting our hands dirty. Just tell us what the new, the new industry is going to be and, and retrain us and reskill us and we'll happily do it. So I think there is an opportunity here. I think um, in my country, the government's just been scared to do it because we all our wealth predominantly has come from coal and exporting mining. It's, that's, that's who we are. So it's a very big risk for our governments to move away from that and they're not willing to have this conversation about the transition. But because these technologies are moving so fast, they're being forced into doing that. And I just yeah. hope that again, yeah, we do this in a human way because there are gonna be casualties if we don't do it properly. I wanna move on, kind of go back to your film a little bit. If you look at the solutions that we model in Drawdown, they're virtually all regenerative development. That is to say, the earth is better off, the people are better off, the communities are better off, the creatures are better off, the birds are better off. No matter what it is, they're better off for it than had we not done it. When you change agricultural practices related to food, you can do two things. One is you stop emitting carbon, CO2, but you're also sequestering. So you're flipping a whole sector Seaweeds actually draw down carbon dioxide from the ocean waters. We can actually restore life in subtropical oceans, restore the fish habitat that's needed to restore fisheries. Seaweed is good for food, animal feed, fertilizer, fiber, and biofuel. There's so much we can do with seaweeds. <laughs> you mentioned seaweed, and I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, or I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about how some of the solutions that you present in your film have started to come to fruition. And it, if I understand correctly, you actually raised money to create a seaweed installation. Is that right? Yeah, so one of the best things about working on this film, you know, the film itself was one aspect, but right from the very beginning, you know, four, four or five years ago when we started, we really wanted to give people entry points for action after they'd seen the film. Um, you know, like yourself, I, I probably I watch a lot of documentaries and often have some kind of emotion at the end, whether it's anger yeah. or inspiration, whatever it might be, and then that emotion dissipates very quickly when you don't have anything to do with it. So we set up this sort of platform where people could activate their own climate plan. We asked them a series of questions, and then based on what they really connected to in the film, we gave them ways to get involved. So um, yes, our community raised almost a million dollars to build the first seaweed platform in Tasmania down here. So we're working with, with one of the universities there. Uh, we did an equity crowdfund and raised a million dollars to uh, build the first microgrid set up here in Australia so people have ownership oh, of that, cool. it's not just a donation. Uh, we've had a million children now being taught the 2040 curriculum materials with 30,000 teachers that have downloaded those. People are mentoring young girls online all around the world to help them get educated. Uh, farmers have been switching to regenerative practices because the public are making a donation to help them transition. So 
you know, again, I think it's very strong evidence that let's move away from this apocalyptic narrative and let's actually tell these stories and inspire people to get involved because a lot of people want to do stuff, they just don't know what to do. It's all so overwhelming. So if we can really align with their own passions and give them things yeah. that they're going to actually see through and commit to, uh, I think we're going to get a lot more action done. Yeah. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned agriculture and, and, and educating you know, farmers uh, on, on new practices to help the soil health and, and to, to extract some more carbon from the air and to plant it back in the soil where it belongs. And Utah has a, a pretty wide swath of rural area. We have a lot of ranchers, we have a lot of farmers. Um, what are some of the lessons that you've learned as, as you know, folks in Australia have been, have been working with farmers to, to reshape their practices and processes that we could learn from here in Utah? Oh man, this this solution just it makes me so happy, and to see the momentum that's <laughs> happening now around you know conservative farmers that would have poo pooed this you know five years ago, are now having these extraordinary wins on their land, and it's just such a beautiful story. So, you know, particularly America. I mean, I think of the stories of the Midwest, um, where yeah. you know again when the first settlers arrived, the soil was eight meters deep, you know, and it's now thirty centimeters. Um, and you know, we know from the UN that we've only got sixty years of topsoil left. That's how much we've degraded our soil. So. Um, the perfect thing we can do is to be planting more diverse species, pulling that carbon from the atmosphere, putting it back in the soil. And once you do that, you know, the water comes back. You know, for every 1% yeah. of carbon that you add to 30 centimetres, 155,000 litres. I mean, it's extraordinary on every rainfall. So farmers are now starting to see this. They're using it. Uh, people are starting to demand those types of foods because they're far healthier. They're far full of f more nutrition because of the richness and the life that's back in the soil. Um, but it's, you know, again, it's again, it's a mental shift because a lot of these farmers for years have been, you know, they've had agronomists in their, in their ears, they've been told they need more chemicals to grow their food. And it can be a yeah. bit of a risk to sort of step away from that. All the debt that they have to transition can be very confronting. So we need to make sure again, like we're doing with the coal workers, that we're setting up systems that allow these farmers to change. And thankfully, we've got really robust studies coming through now. So South Dakota State University did one recently that compared conventional farming to regenerative farming and found that the regenerative farming was now about 78% more profitable because of the wow. dramatic uh, uh, decrease in inputs used on the lands and also because of the higher value of those foods in the marketplace now. So this is why farmers are, are really jumping on board very quickly. Uh, a crisis often is the, is the fillet for these people to change, especially in my country. Uh, and since the, the bushfires, an extraordinary amount of farmers are starting to do this to put more moisture in their land to fireproof their mm. properties. So again, this is what uh, the climate crisis does. This is the, you know, that nature keeps reminding us and it's bringing more and more people into the fold because of its uh, flexing its muscles. So, you know, I think uh, America has always got, already got some terrific pioneers in the region ag space. Uh, and again, that will continue to grow and spread as people just see the common sense nature of it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I only have a couple questions left for you. Um, so we're gonna get kind of high level again. Um, you spent four years making this film, I think, and it's been about a year and a half since it came out. Um, you traveled all over the world, spoke to so many people, spoke to so many children. Uh, I'm curious, after everything you know now, how optimistic are you for the future? <laughs> um, yeah, I think I can, I can sit here and say that we have everything we need in this moment to pull it off. We're not waiting for some miracle solution or some technology. And those things will come. There's no doubt about yeah. it. We're such great innovators. But we could do it right now. And that, to me, gives me enormous comfort. So, yes, I'm fully aware of the challenges we face. I know how dire the, the consequences are. Uh, we're not acting anywhere near fast enough, especially at a government level. But when you look at the states, when you look at local schools and communities right around the world, there is an extraordinary amount of momentum happening. I mean, admit your country might yeah. be a little bit different, but we've seen even China recently announced their own pledge. We've seen that, the, that Europe are also moving with a, a Green New Deal. And I think depending on what happens with your election, um, you know, if you're just looking at it from an environmental perspective, then it's just chalk and cheese. You know, Trump has been unraveling almost a hundred different regulations from the EPA during his term, including polluting more rivers, more tailpipe emissions. I mean, this stuff is a travesty. Uh, and it, even though Biden's policies might not be perfect, he has a very strong team around him with very um, bold ambitions in some areas. And that's encouraging. And that will only grow as, as people see the benefits of that. So, you know, for that alone, as you know, this is such a pivotal uh, election for your country. So um, I am hopeful. I, I just think uh, humans are, 
you know, we value our life, we're very creative, but it takes us to the last minute to actually take action. Like all our Hollywood films, <laughs> just when everything's yeah. gone and you think it's all gonna end, we rise up. So we're yeah. kind of probably playing this hero's journey at large. Um, yeah. So I, I, I do believe we can do it because I've seen it, I've met the people. Uh, it's just about spreading that good word and getting people excited about what's going on. Yeah, this is one movie where you wish that the story was just super boring and we instantly saw the solution and implemented it, but I, I totally get where you're coming from. Um, so I, you, you touched on this where you know you encouraged folks who watch your movie uh, to go to the website, what's your 2048.com and fill out the survey and identify certain things that were unique to them that they could, they could take action on um, to, to, to do something about this if they, if they felt so inclined. And my last question for you is, um, and we get this question all the time, and uh, I, I'm just sort of wondering, outside of going to what's your 2040.com, what do you tell people when they ask you, what can I do to get more involved or to do more? Yeah, I think uh, what we haven't done well is that we've been too prescriptive with that information. We've sort of put out lists that tell people to eat less meat and ride their bike to work and yeah. change their light globes. And I think we've got to realize that everything else in society is catered to the individual so specifically. We know that from algorithms and all, every facet of our life. And it's the same with this. It's about people finding that particular thing that they are passionate about. It might be the energy, it might be food, it might be educating girls. Um, and to actually really pursue that and look into it and see what you can offer in that space. And also just to talk about it more. That's, that's the great barrier we have here. We don't communicate or even have conversations. We're scared of that to have with our family. And again, that's why I made the film. How can we sort of come in from a different angle that isn't triggering and saying the word climate change, but is talking about soil health and it's linked to food. Is talking about, wow, imagine we could own our own energy in our community. You don't even need to say the words climate change there. Yeah. But these things will have an impact on climate change. So I would just encourage anyone uh, to find your passion and to use your words and to understand even that everything you share online now is a collective hive mind that we're creating. It's an information commons. And what are you putting into that commons? Is it fear-based? Is it negative? Or is it actually starting to share hopeful solutions and better stories about what we can achieve as a human race? That's, that's the responsibility we all have uh, and we should be using that power. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Thanks thanks so much for taking the time to, to have this conversation with me and answer these questions, Damon. Your film was absolutely inspiring to me. It was a wonderful refresher and pulled me back uh, to, to a position of hopefulness, I guess, in, in a year that's been pretty crazy. COVID, yeah. a wild election, misinformation everywhere. Utah had an earthquake. I'm not sure why you would know about that, but <laughs> it's been a wild year. Um, and, and it really did help me kind of recalibrate, recalibrate my perspective and set me back on the right path. So thank you very much for taking the time and thank you for making the film. My pleasure, Hunter. Thanks for having me and uh, all the best. Cheers. Nice job, Hunter. And thank you again, Damon, for joining us all the way from Australia. As a reminder, as our special guest this evening, you will receive a link to watch the film 2040 tomorrow. But if you're revved up and ready to watch the film right now, I don't blame you. So here's a link. Uh, to watch. Just remember, you only have until November 3rd to watch it at your leisure. And that reminds me, November 3rd is another important deadline. If you haven't already voted, make sure to take the time and vote for our climate. It's one of the most important things you can do right now. And that, my friends, is an evening of hope. On behalf of the staff and board of Utah Clean Energy, thank you again for joining us tonight. And a huge thank you to everybody who has given so generously already. We simply could not do this work without you. Thank you again and have a great night. <laughs>